Welcome to Untold Pleasure, the Cancer, Sex and Intimacy podcast. Mm. I'm Sarah. And I'm Cheryl. And we will be taking you on a pleasure-focused journey where we aim to end the shame, stigma and silence around cancer, sex and intimacy. So, here we are. It's our first episode, Sarah. I know, it's so exciting. And of course, we've been on this journey for a couple of years now, um, developing the Cancer, Sex and Intimacy Project. So to give you a little overview about the Cancer, Sex and Intimacy Project, it started in about 2020. And since then, we have worked together, myself and Cheryl, to create a space where women and non-binary people can talk about their experience of cancer, sex and intimacy. And through that, we've been running workshops, both online and in person. We've created a booklet, Pleasure and Intimacy, which you can get from us, DM us, email us, whatever you want. And that is a resource that talks about all things cancer, sex and intimacy, sex toys, talking to your partner. We also have a wonderful film that's specifically for healthcare professionals to ask those all important questions. And now we have this wonderful podcast where we'll have the opportunity to speak to people who generally have untold stories. And I think it couldn't just be sex and cancer, could it? Because intimacy is essential. I mean, that space, or it's not even the space between, it's not the link, it is fundamental, isn't it, intimacy? It's absolutely key because if you think about it, the sex is the doing, it's the verb, it's the the action. The intimacy is the build-up, the, what entwines the relationship between two people, what connects you between your body confidence and how you feel and how you love and how you explore and how you exist as a human being. Mm. Whether you're single or whether you're partnered, how you are intimate matters. Mm. And if you think about just having sex for the sake of having sex, that's the physical action, that'll become boring. Mm. It's predictable. Whereas intimacy is intellectual, it's sensual, it's love, it's everything that you can think of that's unspoken, but you, it's like a, a working magic in between how the body functions and how the mind feels and thinks. I love that. I love, so I had to whisper it just then. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and the magic. And I, I think it is. There's something so magic about like, yeah, we are these creatures with these brains where we can think up wonderful things and do wonderful mm-hmm. things. And, you know, the biggest sex organ is the brain, isn't it? Um, and it is that space where intimacy can really run wild. That's right. And I think we absolutely do need to give ourselves that five minutes for the self-love, the exploration of who we are as a physical being in that intimate way. Because I think that's where quality of life sits Mm -hmm. once you've been diagnosed with cancer. If you lose those fundamental parts of you, which can be physical, you know, we've got to remember that there's a psychological part and that's all linked to how you feel about yourself, how confident you are or you're not. So being intimate for me is just so deep. It's, it's so crucial. We can't miss that bit out. And I think, as I said, it's linked to quality of life Mm. and we absolutely should have that as part of our holistic healing journey. And it's that, this is like allowing the space for that pleasure. Um, giving yourself the permission to really feel that you can be that sexual being. I mean, we've touched upon this a lot of times over the course of the Cancer, Sex and Intimacy project, and we're going to really delve into that Mm. with the podcast. But, like, we are deserving of pleasure. Absolutely. So deserving. And we deserve to have our minds lubricated. (laughs) Absolutely, and we're going to do it, aren't we, Sarah? Yeah, that's the mission. Lubricate the minds (laughs) and the vaginas will follow. (laughs) Love it. So we thought it would be good to start by telling you a bit about who we are, 
to start with, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2017. So I was about um, 25, 26 when I was diagnosed. And you're thrown into this completely new world, new experience. You're having to stop working. Your life just completely pauses. And I had a lot of different treatments, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, antibody therapy, and all of that culminated in a stem cell transplant in February 2018. And it was really um, during that time and after, as I entered into the recovery phase, that I started to feel the great effects that cancer treatment can have on your ability to have the sex that you want to have. So early menopause was one of the side effects. And off the back of that, I also developed something called vaginismus, um, which is an involuntary tightening of the vagina when there's any kind of penetration attempted, whether that's a finger, a dildo, or a partner's penis. So there were a lot of things that I wasn't able to do post-transplant. And all of a sudden I was like, why is this happening? Uh, I wasn't told about this. Sex and intimacy was never discussed as part of my cancer journey. And that caused a huge amount of frustration for me, especially down the line when I had some quite upsetting side effects um, that really weren't discussed. So this kind of set me on a little bit of a mission. Firstly, I plucked up the courage to ask my CNS, um, and describe what my symptoms were. And her response was, unfortunately, oh, um, I've never heard of that before. Just um, try some lube. And that was the end of the conversation, which was not the response I wanted. I wanted to be signposted. I wanted to be referred to a clinic. I wanted to be held and understood. And I wanted my pleasure to be valued. Like, yes, I was in remission at that point. Wonderful. But there is this very upsetting side effect. And my ability to have the sex that I wanted at the time was being completely compromised and affected. And with that is, of course, the holistic side, the loss of libido, the change in the body. So really that put me on a mission to think like, okay, am I unique here? Is this really um, something that people have never heard of before? So I was at an event with a wonderful uh, Macmillan professional and we were just chatting and I was, I've always been very engaged in my own sexuality and experimenting. So I said to her, you know what we need to do? We need to run a sex toy workshop for women affected by cancer and it should be fun and it should be inclusive and enjoyable and, and just reclaim that kind of side of our, of our life. And luckily, the Macmillan professional loved the idea. So we went on a bit of a journey together. Now, I had been a customer at the wonderful female-focused sex-positive shop, Shush, for a few years. And I knew that they really were the people that we could connect with here. So this was when Shush had a site in Hoxton. I went through the door and that is when I met the most wonderful person called Renee, who is joining us today on the podcast. And we had a conversation all about intimacy and pleasure and how that should not be removed just because you have a diagnosis or an experience of cancer. So with Renee on board and at the time um, Macmillan on board, we went on this wonderful journey and created a space where we could gather a group of um, women together to talk about their experiences of sex and cancer. And that brings me to the moment that I met the most wonderful collaborator and friend, Cheryl. Oh, thank you, Sarah. That is one, what a wonderful introduction to our project. So I'm Cheryl, the other half of Cancer, Sex and Intimacy. So I was diagnosed with neuroendocrine cancer in July 2017. The abdominal surgery was quite extensive and the scar still painful six years on. And um, I thought at some point somebody's going to say, Cheryl, how are you getting on with that scar? We know we had to open you twice um, within the same night. So perhaps the scar's not healing very well. How are you going to manage intimacy? But it's never been spoken about. And that's no sort of slight on my team because they are the most amazing people, really have been fantastic and I appreciate everything they do. But no one ever spoke to me about how the scarring would work out, if I'd feel any pain or literally how I'd navigate being intimate with someone again. And six years on, it's still not happened. So basically I'd, I'd met up with 
the same professional from Macmillan that Sarah had been with. And um, I expressed to her that I was interested in finding out why people weren't being asked about their sex life post-cancer. So she said, I think there's someone you need to meet. And I think there's a session that you need to go to. And that's at the wonderful Shush Women's Store where Renee was. And um, from there, we basically met Sarah. And the rest is history. That's where Cancer, Sex and Intimacy was formed. But the wonderful thing about that session is it opened my eyes to a whole world of people who also did not have sex or intimacy discussed during their treatment, after their treatment, or asked the question at any time. And for me, these people were shrouded by stigma, shame, and silence. And this is what this project aims to bring to a close. It needs to stop. We need to make sure that we're out there, loud and proud, talking about cancer, sex and intimacy, because after all, how did we all get here? So we are now going to have a discussion with our main collaborators. Renee from Shush Women's Store will be joining us to talk about all things cancer, sex, intimacy, toys, pleasure, fun. And we'll also be joined by Emma from Shine Cancer Support, who is one of our main charity partners and supports the project in a beautiful and holistic way. Hi, Renee. Hi, Sarah and Cheryl. Thank you for having me today. This is very exciting. You're most welcome. You are a very exciting person to have here. And there's wonderful things on the table as well, which we'll be talking about later. And we will also be doing a wonderful description of them because, of course, you can't see them at home. That's right. Um, which will be very fun for me and Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them come with uh, motors as well, so oh. we'll be able to hear um, the thrilling the all-important yeah. buzzing. The all-important buzzing. <laughs> so, Renee, please tell us about Shush and its ethos and how you got into this line of work. Yes. So, Shush was the UK's first female-focused sex shop. Um, it opened in 1992 after the founder, Kai Hoyle, went to Soho to buy some toys for herself and she found that she wasn't welcome in any sex shops at that time. So they were run by men. There were four men. They were mainly dusty Mr. Big Dong with balls hanging off them. And um, Kai has um, explained that one of the things that was said to her was, oh, we don't get many of your sort in here, which is basically a woman. So um, she had a few glasses of wine and she thought, you know what, I can do this better. And um, she rented a space in Hoxton, just off um, Hoxton Square, very sort of bright pink shop. And I happened to live in Hoxton at the time. So I came across the shop quite by mistake, just out walking. And at the time, you used to have to sort of ring the doorbell and they would sort of look at you to see if you could come in. And men could only come in as guests of women. So there were no lone random men hanging about. So I went in and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I want to work in here. And one Sunday morning, I was very hungover in my dressing room at home, browsing the Shush website, as you do. And there was a sort of little advert saying dynamic retail manager wanted. And I thought, you know what? That is my job. It didn't even occur to me that Kai might not hire me. <laughs> I, I was so sassy, so ballsy. I was just like, yeah, that is my job. That's how it is. So I uh, went for an interview, uh, got the job, um, and um, we're now 17 years later. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but over the years, I have met thousands and thousands and thousands of women, uh, women and their lovers. And many of these women are in very similar positions to yourself. So when Sarah came to see me at the shop, it wasn't the first time I'd heard about a woman being in that situation where her there's no one to offer her advice of her sex life or the things that have changed or the things that she wants. Um, and at the time, we were also doing a support group, like a sex positive support group for um, female survivors of sexual violence. And um, as Sarah was talking, I think I explained a little bit about this to her. And I think she said, you know, wouldn't it be great if if women with 
or you know living beyond cancer would have access to something similar. Um, so I think that's sort of where where Sarah started to think about it and the amazing person that she is she made it happen because for <laughs> for many people that that you'd kind of go away and you think wouldn't it be good if there was something like this but you don't know how to make it happen or who should be involved and how do you go about it and what are people going to feel about me or say about me if I'm out there talking about sex and pleasure Uh, but Sarah made it happen, Sarah and Cheryl together, which is really quite amazing. Um, and just before the pandemic, um, Sarah and a lovely lady from Macmillan came to see me at the shop. So we were talking about doing sex positive workshops for women living with and beyond cancer. And um, we did a couple of the workshop on Zoom, which was a really lovely experience. And I feel like it reached more women that way. So I feel like, yeah, I would love to have done it in person. I love doing it in person. But also there is a there's a limit for how many women are able to come to the sessions or feel able to come to the sessions. That is quite a, it can be quite confronting. But um we started online and here we are. Yes, and it's been such a wonderful uh, collaboration. And again, I was lucky that I was an East End resident and, and yeah. knew about <laughs> Shesh and just, you know, thank the the stars for this connection that we could make and run such amazing workshops and do all this work. Um, so what is it that you have found that are some of the main topics or issues that come up around sex and intimacy for um, women and people living with cancer? There are quite a few, um, but I have found that they are sort of very similar. So whilst there are sort of different women and and people uh, with different lived experiences, but the the issues and the comments seem to be quite similar. So the first one is penis in vagina. Mm. So society and media tells us that sex is penis in vagina. If there's no penis in the vagina, it's not sex. Um, and if you are not well enough or, you know, you're tired, your treatment is taking a lot out of you or you don't feel the same about your body, um, this might not be on the table at all. So I think it's really important to talk about rephrasing sex, you know, reframing it, looking at what sex actually is. So that's one of the things we do. Um, another thing uh, that's really common is um, you, you mentioned early menopause. So suddenly being thrust into menopause with no uh, no idea that this might happen or what it might involve is another issue. So there's a lot of vaginal atrophy um, when the vagina shrinks and it becomes drier. Sex might become very painful. Um, the body might look different from how it looked before. Um, sensations might have gone, you might not have sensations in certain body parts anymore, or you might not react to stimulation the same way. Um, so those are the main concerns. So dryness, pain, and what sex actually is. Um, also, another thing that is really common, um, like you said, Sarah, and, and you, Cheryl, um, that medical professionals, doctors, nurses, therapists, they're not generally willing to talk about sex. It's almost as if they're saying, well, you've survived or you, you you know you are where you are so so why why are you not happy with that why why do you want more um and i think also partly because they themselves are perhaps not comfortable with sex they don't want to talk about sex they don't know how to talk about sex and i've met many therapists who they are psychosexual therapists um but they're not comfortable talking about sex which blows my mind Completely. Um, but that is also what I'm for. So they are able to to sort of signpost to me. Um, so I can then talk intimately with, with each person about what it is they would like to experience, how they would like to experience it, um, and offering practical solutions. Oh, I think that's it. It's so important. It's those practical solutions. There's, there's such a holistic side to living with and beyond cancer. And of course, you know, it's always important to talk to your medical team if necessary. But when it comes to that reclaiming pleasure and redefining sex, it's so important to have that space to do that and be be kind of given the permission. And I think that's what we always try and do with Cancer, Sex and Intimacy as a group. Just like you have the permission to think about pleasure, regardless of what's happened to your body. 
it really is yours to experience. Um, and we'll talk more about this as we um, have our discussion later in the podcast. Uh, but now I'd like to uh, bring us back to Cheryl, who is going to talk with Emma. We have the wonderful Emma Willis, who is the co-founder of Shine Cancer Support. It's a charity which looks after adults with cancer in their 20s, 30s and 40s. So, Emma, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Of course. Hi, everyone. And thanks so much for having me as well. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I guess, um, I mean, you've, you've said the, the basics. I think Shine is that we're a small national charity that supports anyone with any type of cancer diagnosis in their 20s, 30s and 40s. Um, and we do lots of different things to support people in the ways that suit them. So a lot of it is about peer support. It's about connecting people with other people with similar experiences uh, and then we try and plug the gaps really in the information and advice that's out there you know specifically for people in this age group um, I think um, I was diagnosed with cancer in my late 20s and it took me two years to meet anyone within 20 years of my age that had also had cancer um, and I didn't really realize at the time but uh, you know when I finally did meet people closer to my own age I realized that was exactly what I'd been missing and I was you know previously isolated feeling like I was the only person that this had happened to and you know people were sharing me pictures of their grandchildren when I was wondering about my fertility or talking about how they managed to retire early when I was obviously, you know, in my 20s, nowhere near retiring. So, um, yeah, lots of different kind of issues. So I think that was where where Shine began, really, was just trying to, um, you know, pull together other people so that nobody felt as isolated as I had um, and also trying to kind of get some advice and information together about those things that are missing in uh, like the the kind of standard cancer support services that are out there. Okay so can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up working with with us? Oh yeah so um, I think I think and correct me if I'm wrong but I think originally we just started following each other on Instagram mm. um, and I think you know as soon as I saw I mean I love your Instagram um, and as you. soon as we saw your posts we were all like oh my god have you seen this have you seen this this looks amazing <laughs> um, and you know like I said I, I think uh, we've obviously talked about it since but sex and relationships and dating and all of those issues is one of the key topics that we try and focus on but um, obviously we're a small charity and there are lots of things to do uh, and just to see somebody in that space doing things that were really relatable and really needed by um, by our community was really exciting for us um, and since then um, we've done quite a lot together right so um, I think the first um, kind of big thing we did together would have been Shine Connect last year that's correct um which is our our conference which obviously last year was fully online you know still with the remnants of of covid around so um Sarah and Cheryl came and um, delivered a session at Connect Online for, for people that were attending that, um, talking, you know, really candidly about sex and, um, you know, how how that can be impacted and were, were really helpful for our, um, our community. Um, and then, you know, we've been working more closely together ever since I think it's a uh, uh, you know it's a win-win for us um hopefully it's a win-win for you oh absolutely too. Um, just, just something really important and to find Sarah and Cheryl doing some brilliant work in this area was was really great for us so bearing in mind that you're working with groups in their 20s 30s and 40s what would you say is at the forefront of most people's minds for people who are joined you know they've joined a charity yeah, there's there's quite a few things. I think we we did back in kind of 2012. I'm going back a little bit now. We did a um, an impact survey um, just with the kind of small community we had back then, because we we thought we knew what the issues were, and we know that you know a lot of the things that we talk about are things that are important to anyone with a cancer diagnosis. But we wanted to kind of get to the bottom of specifically what were the issues for younger people, and we now work on 
six key themes. Um, so the, the main one of those, again, it's something that does impact anyone with a diagnosis is living with uncertainty. Uh, and I think that can be sometimes one of the toughest things of, you know, managing a, a cancer diagnosis. But we also focus on things like going back to work, fertility, bringing up children, like having young children while you're going through treatment and the financial impact of cancer, which is obviously quite big in this area. And then we also focus on relationships and dating. Uh, and I think that's something that, you know, is really impacted probably across all ages, but specifically in our age group where you might be, you know, not quite settled. So you're not necessarily, you know, married with three kids already. And, you know, you're maybe at the start of your dating life or early into a relationship. So uh, it's something that we, that gets talked about a lot. So you you mentioned the impact survey. So in relation to that, what did most people say about sex and relationships? Was it mentioned? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we we probably look at it a, a bit broader, like most of the questions about those kind of relationships, talking about all sorts of relationships, so friendships, existing partnerships or, or dating. Probably the most shocking statistics are at like 62% of people said that they felt that their friends and people around them treated them differently after a diagnosis, um, not necessarily in a positive way. Um, but also there's quite a lot of issues around, you know, over a quarter of people said that they were reluctant to start new relationships, um, whether that's friendships or, um, you know, more intimate relationships. And I think confidence issues that that you face after a diagnosis, whether that's but like body confidence or just in general, your confidence can be quite badly affected, you know, through a diagnosis and all of your treatment plans. And it can make it really difficult to get out there, I guess, and, and you know, meet people and um, and chat. And the other things that people talk about quite often are, are like if they're in a relationship, that their relationship status can change. So where someone's been... I guess, become more of a carer, you know, so they see mm. their partner as like someone who's ill or that needs looking after. And it can be really difficult to kind of switch back into that, you know, more intimate relationship. Thank you. I love Emma. When can I yes. meet her? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you, Emma. And let's all get together now and have the all important discussion. So we're going to welcome back Rene. Rene, I'll bring this to you first. What are those first tentative steps someone can do who's looking to just think about being intimate again, whether it's with themselves or with a partner? What are those gentle steps that someone could take to reconnect with that side of themselves? Mm, and um, I'm really glad that you said gentle steps because my first um, advice, piece of advice would be be really kind with yourself. Um, so it may be that your body doesn't feel like your own anymore. And maybe you've had doctors and nurses and specialists that have been poking and prodding and you haven't seen yourself as a sexual being for a long time. Um, so you are not going, it's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to go from not feeling sexual to being ready to attend sex parties over a weekend. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so uh, you can think about it, fantasize it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> we like those fantasies. But be really, really gentle with yourself. And I would say to take really, really small steps. First of all, my suggestion would be to maybe write a list of five non-penetrative things that you would like to try. So I would say whether you have a partner or you're by yourself, any kind of penetration, anything that society tells you is sex, take that off straight away. So kind of think about uh, maybe I would um, like to be able to, to stroke my skin uh, and feel sensual about it. And it can be really difficult to stay with the sensation of stroking your skin. So, you know, in the morning you have your shower, you kind of slap on some body lotion. Take two minutes to kind of see how that body lotion feels on your skin. Maybe um, you could massage, you could put like a face mask on, you could put a little bit of nail varnish on, whatever it is, something that makes you feel sensual, something that makes you feel good about yourself. And it might be that you're not able to do all five things 
in a day, a week or a month, that's absolutely fine. These are just five things for yourself. Once you've mastered those five things, you might think, okay, that was that was good. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of feeling good about this. Maybe I would like to think about a sexual fantasy. Our biggest sexual body part is actually our brains. Uh, but the brains are also really tricky to keep focused. It's tricky to keep your brain focused on sensuality and sex because you might start and it might feel good. And then all of a sudden you think, oh, I touched that body part. I don't like having that touched or touching this bit reminds me of something else. Or maybe I have wet laundry in the mum machine. You know, maybe I need to go off and do something else. So keeping your mind focused, and this could be through erotic stories stories. Uh, you can download very erotic stories. You can also write your own erotic stories. I'm, I'm a huge fan of writing your own erotic stories. Um, you can download some feminist erotica. Uh, you can download sexy, sexy videos, whatever it is that helps keep your mind on sensuality for a short while. Um, that helps. When you're ready, you can kind of start figuring out where your new erogenous zones may be. They may not be the same erogenous zone as previously, but you might find that maybe the inside of your elbow is really receptive, maybe the inside of your knees. And you don't have to touch any body parts that you don't feel comfortable touching. Um, I've got one of my little toys here. This is a very soft pink fluffy pom. This is wonderful for just like sensual stroking. You can literally just stroke your skin. I'm oh, getting nice sensual actually doing a demonstration, here. which is amazing. Yes. Hello, Ooh. Cheryl. Thank you for Hello. lending me your arm. So this is a very soft, I'm going to pass this to you, Cheryl. Just Thank kind you. of stroke it over your, your skin, your face. Ooh. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So this isn't, it's a sensual, oh, pass it to, oh, yes. to Sarah. I, I know, I'm getting jealous. <laughs> Sorry, Emma, we can't <laughs> Uh, we can't pass oh, it to you. I'm missing out by not being <laughs> in the studio. Uh, but it's a very soft, sensual way of finding erogenous zones. And you probably have a lot of things at home that you could use. You might have a soft feather. You might have a leather glove. Uh, you might have even a clean duster. Anything <laughs> that's that. nice and soft. Or another thing that is fun is, you know, those bath scrunchies that you scrub yourself yeah. with? One of those when they're dry, it kind of gives gives you like really nice sensations as well. Mm. So anything that can help you feel sensual. So Renee, we mentioned earlier that some healthcare professionals, not all, they're a little bit hesitant to talk about sex and intimacy with their cancer patients. Do you think you know why there's still a taboo around that with some medical teams? That's really tricky to answer, Cheryl, to be honest. I don't really know why. I feel like we're in 2023. This mm -hmm. is a really, really important question. I feel like they should have training on it. Um, and I feel like women and folks should be able to bring up these questions. So first of all, someone needs the information mm -hmm. and just plucking up the courage to ask the question, that takes a lot. And then to be shut down, to say, well, you know, just yeah. use a bit of lubrication. It will be fine. Or I had one customer came to the shop and she's a twice survivor of anal cancer. And chemo and radiotherapy had split her clitoris in two. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't ready to give up on her sex life, which, you know, she shouldn't be. She wanted pleasure. You mm -hmm. know, she wanted to feel like herself again. So she'd spoken to her doctor to say that this was God's way of telling her that her sex life is over, Ooh, which is just no. horrendous. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. this is obviously an issue that the doctor have uh, with a woman wanting pleasure, maybe, or bringing God into this, that kind of, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. that made sense to the doctor. But then saying that to this patient who's come to the doctor looking for advice, that that's just awful. So she came to the shop and she was very candid. She was very open. She explained what had happened, um, how she felt about it. And I did spend about an hour, two hours with her. And I sent her home with a wand vibrator, which is sort of like a big, almost like a baseball bat looking thing. It's wow. not the most <laughs> discreet sex toy. <laughs> and um, and an arousal oil and the all essential bottle of lube because it is essential to use lube. Mm. And before 10 o'clock the next morning, she called me to say she'd had an orgasm. You know, so wow. I think that for me, I'm getting goosebumps now. That's yeah. like one of my most 
wonderful memories um, mm. to being able to help her with that. But also kind of knowing that there are people who are not willing to give that help or they can't mm. give that help because they don't have the information. But I feel also as a health professional, if you don't have the the advice, if you're not knowledge, knowledgeable about that particular thing, that's fine. But you need to be able to signpost to someone who can offer that practical advice and someone who's not going to shy away from it mm -hmm. and kind of go, well, if your doctor said that's how it is, please don't, you know, don't bother yourself with the sexual pleasure. It's, it's just sorry, this is going to come out. It's absolute bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> to be <laughs> it's honest. It's so true. And I think mm. it's that. And we've got to empower ourselves a bit as patients to do that advocacy work. It's a mm. shame we're not being asked. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Emma, coming to you, I know um, through Shine, you do a lot of work with like, how do we advocate for ourselves? And you also work with um, healthcare professionals to have those all important conversations. I know not just around sex and intimacy, but and what advice would you give to um, someone who does need to ask an essential question? What can you do to kind of advocate for yourself in those, in those spaces? Yeah, thanks. I think it's, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because I think, you know, you can see that even if you have got the, I guess it's the confidence or the ability to ask your healthcare professionals questions, that they probably don't have the answers or are maybe uncomfortable talking about it. And then that little bit of confidence that you had to ask the question is then gone. So, you know, you can't ask a follow up question. And I think, you know, what we try and do is empower people to keep asking um, and to say that it, it's, it's okay to ask, you know, this is a relevant question that is important that you should be able to get information from. And if it's not your consultant, then there should be someone else. So if, you know, you've had a bad experience by asking a question to, I don't know, say your surgeon or your oncologist, um, then actually ask them the next question, which is, who do you think I should talk to about this? Mm. Or is there someone else available that would be able to answer these questions? And I think, in an ideal world, it would be something that healthcare professionals would bring up with us as patients so that we're free to have that conversation or not. But putting the kind of onus on the patient to bring it up makes it really difficult. Um, and I think, you know, that is the the only way we can do it is to keep talking about it more. Um, we do cover it actually in our training for healthcare professionals. So we we talk about how important it is to have space to ask questions, whether it's the the physical changes that you've already mentioned, like the dryness, the pain, menopause symptoms. So yeah, I think I think the answer is just to talk about it more. Um, but it is a shame, really, that you know, especially if you've got kind of a medical issue, that it's not easy to bring it up and it's not easy to get the answers you want. Can I um, say something else here? Um, I think also for men, it's it's more acceptable for men. So doctors and, and healthcare professionals, they do tend to ask about the erections and uh, pleasure and sex and whether they're kind of having orgasms. Um, but female sexuality tends to be sort of like the off topic, you know, let's not talk about vaginas or clitorises and, and orgasms with women because it's it's not the done thing, you know. So I think there's a, there's a huge disparity between how male patients and female uh, patients are sort of being treated. Yeah, there's definitely so many assumptions made, isn't it? It's like, oh, well, they're not going to want to talk about this or that kind of unfortunate societal assumption that the female pleasure does not matter or it's not as relevant or we're just not as sexual beings but I mean I certainly am a highly sexual being <laughs> Cheryl we've got some booklets that came up um, as part of the project, the Pleasure and Intimacy booklet that um, Rene consulted on, along with multiple um, people living with and beyond cancer and uh, gynae CNSs as well. We would be holding one up, but of course... He can't see it. Can't see it. But yeah, Cheryl, tell us a bit more about the booklet. Okay, so the booklet is beautiful to look at. It's non-gendered. It's a booklet that takes you through how to find yourself again how to recover that body confidence, how to be gentle with yourself, as Renee mentioned, how to explore different avenues for advice, as Emma mentioned, 
And as Sarah spoke so candidly about her own journey where she wasn't spoken to at all, it takes you through a real treasure trove of help and advice. So if you haven't downloaded our booklet, Pleasure and Intimacy, do follow us on Instagram. It's downloadable or if you just drop us a DM, we can put one in the post to you. But that booklet, we now encourage people to take along to their consultations. If there's a section in there that you feel very shy or unsure of in speaking to your oncologist or your doctor, open the page, drop the booklet nicely on the desk and say, this is what we're going to talk about today. If they go red, that's up to them. But we know that once you leave that room, you should be signposted to someone that can help you. If you need to connect with your partner, share it with your your partner, share it with your friends. Just show them what you're going through and what you need to speak about. Just be open about it. But let that booklet literally take you on that journey that you should have started after your cancer treatment or your surgery. Oh, yeah, that's beautifully described. I think the booklet is sort of something very special. And I think it's talking about all those colours as well. And Because we wanted people to really see this and see themselves in it. And mm. we even asked our steering group and our mailing list, like, what colours do you want to see? And people said, all the colours of the rainbow, not pink, you know, because there's, <laughs> there's a lot of that kind of pink washing around cancer, especially the breast cancer experience. And, you know, cancer is something that affects everyone. And yes, the work we do is focused on women and non-binary people, but we also want to create a resource that can resonate with as many people as possible and inspire people to start their own projects as well. We're a group, we're a small group, but we want to make a big impact. Absolutely. Um, And, you know, flicking through the booklet, there is a wonderful section, the lovely turning of pages, about toys. So, you know, when you're starting to feel a little bit more confident, maybe you want to try um, something new. And Rene has a wonderful array of toys on the desk. So, Rene, perhaps just walk us through a little bit about what's on the table here. My pleasure. So, uh, literally, <laughs> I would like to start with a lube. Um, so, as we've mentioned, lube is essential. Lube is your best friend. So, whether you are a cancer patient or not, um, Um, You should have lube, but definitely if you've gone through any kind of treatment, you have menopausal issues, it can literally transform your sex life and your pleasure, whether that is with yourself or with a partner. Now, there are so many lubes out on the market and we often get the question, but which one is suitable for me? Which one is the best one? Um, There is no such thing as the best. It kind of depends on what you like. I've got two lubes with me today um, and they have been approved by a cancer nurse specialist. So I know that there's nothing in here that should cause any kind of issues for anyone. Um, There is a really good lube on the market called Yes Lube. Uh, Yes is organic. And I know that many doctors and therapists, they recommend it. And it's a really good lube, but it is quite thin. So it sinks into your skin quite quickly. So my recommendation would be, would be to go for something slightly slightly thicker. And I'm going to explain the differences. This is like how Ooh. it sounds like mm. when you're <laughs> shaking the bottle. Cheryl, may I borrow your finger, please? You don't have to ask. No. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is called Shush Pure. So um, Cheryl and I have a little bit of lube on our fingers. So if you rub those two fingers together, your thumb and your forefinger, that feels mm. nice and slick. Ooh. And if you then rub your dry fingers together, although you are properly lubed up now, (laughs) but you can feel the difference. So lube creates enhanced sensations. It makes it easier to touch. And especially if you don't produce a lot of moisture on your own, sex Mm -hmm. and play can be very painful. So that's a really great one. If you taste a little bit, Cheryl, if you put a bit on your tongue, perfectly safe. Um, I wouldn't eat it with a spoon, (laughs) but it's perfectly fine to get in your mouth. Tastes quite nice. Yes, and it doesn't have a bitter aftertaste. So this is important. So if you are likely to have the kind of play where you might get a little bit of lube or a lot of lube, looking at Cheryl, (laughs) uh, in your mouth, uh, you want to make sure that you don't mind the taste of it. So this is Shush Pure Lube. It's water-based and paraben-free, which is very, very body-friendly. But I do have a thicker version. So this is called Shush Pure Plus. 
It is really, really thick. So if you experience a lot of dryness or if like Sarah, you've experienced vaginismus where you need to do dilation, using a thicker lube is my best tip because it's sort of creating an almost padded layer between the fingers. Can you feel it? It's kind of really nice and thick. Yes. And it's, it's longer lasting. So the thicker your lube is, the longer it will last. So that's Shush Pure Plus. Again, water based and paraben free. This one is also safe to have in your mouth, but I will say it creates a thick layer over your teeth. So if you wanted to do oral sex, for example, on someone, I wouldn't recommend this one. This is more for sort of like vaginal or anal play. Okay. Also, anal lubes, um, even if you're not interested in anal sex, if you don't want to try it, anal lubes tend to be thicker. So they can be really good for, for vaginas who feel dry and sore. But um, I'm also available in the Shush website chat box. So if you wanted to find out which lube might be best for you, pop in there and say hello. Now, um, Sarah, so you mentioned vaginismus at Mm. the beginning. Um, We meet so many women and non-binary folks who struggle with vaginismus. So vaginismus is a condition when the vagina... It's almost like it's it's shutting it's it's shutting the garage doors is what I say. It's mm-hmm. got nothing is going to park in there. It might be that you're able to insert a small finger, or you might be able to insert a tampon, but equally you might not be able to insert anything at all. And for a lot of people, that can be stressful for so many reasons, including trying to go for a smear test, which can literally save your life, and you're not going to be able to do that. So for folks with vaginismus, um, they tend to do something called dilation which is teaching um, or retraining your vagina to open up and relax. The NHS will often give you plastic dilators. They are really quite horrible. It's sort of like a set of plastic insertables in variable sizes. We tend to go a slightly different route. So we have created the world's first soft vibrating dilation sets um, that we can absolutely talk to anyone about who wants to know more. But the thing is here, you don't have to use dilators. Anything that's a good shape and size and material for you can be used. Now, your doctor or health professional might not say, go get yourself a dildo. You know, they might no. say this is a this is a <laughs> medical uh, dilation set. Use this one. For some people, they prefer the medical aspect and using the dilators. For other people, they want to focus on pleasure. Um, so I'm going to just reach over to some toys. One toy that I'm very excited to show today could be used as a dilator in the later stages. So the tip is probably about two, two and a half fingers Girth. Both Sarah and Cheryl are very excited about this. I can see them looking. Ooh. And oh, that um, sounds wonderful. <laughs> this is wonderful. Ear. Can you hear it? <laughs> um, so, what I have here is a, sort of like a modern version of a rabbit vibrator. So, it actually has a little wheel. Let's pop a little bit of lubrication on the wheel that would stimulate the clitoral area. It looks and a bit like a water wheel, doesn't it? It does look like a water wheel. And if you feel there, oh, la, la. it's like a. <laughs> it's um, it's like a, a wheel of soft tongue tips, silicone tongue tips that basically licks at the clitoral area. And there is also an insertable shaft that when you are ready, that could be insertable. So this is a vibrator. It's a rechargeable waterproof vibrator that can be used as a dilator if you want to, or it could be used for pleasure, of course. And we also find that if you can incorporate pleasure into your dilation, you are likely Mm. to want to do it. Mm. If it's painful, it's It's a turn off. You're not going to want to do it. If you kind of go, oh, actually, that looks quite fun. I might try that. Um, Now, one thing I wanted to show my ladies in here. I'm showing Sarah and Cheryl a picture of the internal workings of a vulva owner. So the golden part is the clitoris. So when you look at the picture of vulva or vagina, if you see the clitoris, is the small part that kind of sticks out. But there is a big part of the clitoris that sits inside, sort of between the inner and the outer labia lips. So even if you've had the outer part of the clitoris removed or it's been damaged, there is still a possibility to experience great pleasure with the right tools. I now have a very 
pretty little panty vibrator. Ooh. So this one is shaped sort of, oh, let me turn this on, sort of like a, how would you describe that? It's got sort of like a little curve. It's a bit like a snail. Yes. It looks like, um, you know, those madeleines, those French... Oh, yes, that you can eat. Yes. That's right. It's a vibrating madeleine. delicious. Yeah. <laughs> it's a delicious vibrating madeleine. So the idea with this one, and I will pass it around, it has very strong vibration. You put it on the inside of your panty, your knickers, your boxer shorts, and it has a magnet to Ooh. sit. I know, my boobs are vibrating now. <laughs> I haven't put it in my knickers, she people. It in her top. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to tr- try that, Cheryl. So the little curve would sit sort of in the opening of the vagina and it vibrates the whole vulva area. Mm. So even if you don't have the outer part of the clitoris, if you have the clitoral legs and the clitoral bulbs, this toy will vibrate the internal. It's strong enough. Can you wear this on public transport? (laughs) <laughs> you can. And I think if you struggle with low libido, pop it into your knickers, your panties, do your housework. Oh, I never get I anything know. done, <laughs> You'd have such a clean house. <laughs> I tell you. So it's cleaning time. Yeah. Yeah. Cleaning time. <laughs> right, so we have a really cute little sweet pop. If anyone found this in your drawer, they wouldn't know that it's a sex toy. It literally looks like a little... One of those gumballs with a little mm. handle. Now, if I pass that to you, Cheryl. So these, this is not designed to go inside. This is not for the vagina, not for the anus. This is literally for external pleasure. Ooh. So again, really strong vibration oh, for such a small wow. toy. Feel free to put it on your pubic bone, Sarah. Oh. So even though it's not directly <laughs> onto your genitals, yes, you'll feel the... <laughs> So You'll feels, feel the vibration through. I can. And it's so, uh, and actually putting it somewhere that's not directly onto the genital area, like it's this nice, gentle, ambient pleasure. Yeah. Which could be a really nice way to start. And it's doesn't, it's, you know, it doesn't all have to be, vibrators can be used on any part of the they body. They can be can't any they? part. A friend of mine, she likes to vibrate her sinuses when she has a cold. You know? And Ooh, yeah, your neck, your arms, neck. the Ooh. inside of your. Uh, We're getting moaning in the studio. (laughs) We love it. We love it. Um, Then I have a little suction toy. So the clitoral suction toys are really popular. Now, you do need a clitoris for this to be able to work as it should. But it's a gentle, non-touching way to stimulate a clitoris. If you pop your thumb in the hole. So this one is a white snowman. It's very (laughs) seasonally appropriate for this time of year. And it sits on and around the clitoral area and it sucks it. Yes, it comes with little patterns. Wow. (laughs) So absolutely all toys always use lubrication. And even if you do produce a lot of moisture of your own, there might be dry patches or maybe you run out of moisture, Mm. you know. So always use moisture. That's it. We're a long session and we're not machines, you know. No. Let's let's get the lube involved. Now, also for for people who feel that um, they're not interested in vaginal play or maybe they're no longer able to have vaginal play, if the anus, if the butthole is still intact, you may want to play with the butt. That is another option. Uh, So the butt is not self-lubricating at all. So lube is a must. So I've got a string of anal beads. Um, So a string of anal beads is flexible. So it follows the internal curve. It has a selection of graduating beads along the string. Now this one is quite a long string, so you don't need to insert all of it. If you want to insert one or two beads, that's enough. But also they can be used for vaginal play. So if you are uh, dilating, for example, just a small one. It's actually smaller than than the tip of my pinky finger. So even though something is labelled as an anal toy, you can figure out ways to use it that works for you. So anything that goes into your bottom needs to be safe. It needs to have a safe base or a flared handle. Um, the butt is a hungry beast. Um, <laughs> even if you're not feeling particularly turned on, the butt might feel very turned on. And um, before you know it, if you lose control of the toy, you might end up in A&E for Ouch. very bad reasons. So only use 
but safe toys mm. the butt very important um got a couple of more things here so what i have is a pink satin blindfold oh blindfolds blindfold. <laughs> are amazing they're very very sensual toys this is also really nice to do with a partner especially mm. if you are just getting back to intimacy um so blindfolding your partner means that they can't look directly at you so you can sort of relax into the the whatever movements or motions or massage you're doing or you can wear it yourself um and when you wear a blindfold you're heightening all the other sensual sensations so if you have a partner stroking their fingertips over your skin you will feel it so much more intensely um Cheryl please <laughs> you don't need to ask me don't twice. need to ask twice oh, so wow. I have a... Cheryl is currently Cheryl is blindfolding herself blindfolding this is what happens in the studio on a Monday morning I have a little fluttery vibrator that I'm just mm. gonna stroke over the skin so this is sensual play this is just kind of mm. getting into the mood it's not sexual I'm not going to touch mm. any of her genitals thank you Cheryl not today you may take that yes <laughs> not today not in here Give this a little feel. So this is a fluttery juju amour bullet. So this one is, wow. it's a really, really cool toy. So it's not been designed to be inserted anywhere. It is literally just very what gentle. you're doing. It's very gentle. It's stroking skin. And if you have half an hour to yourself, make a date with yourself, a little toy like this, just kind of explore it over various parts of your body. You might find that you're you're sort of developing sensations in body part that you didn't feel were particularly sexy before um and with a toy like this it has several settings so if you find that the arousal begins to grow you can turn it up to get a little bit more oomph and i can see sarah is sort of just like playing I with it in her one. hands it's really really cute it's really sensual it's non threatening yeah i think it's that it's you know It's about doing things that can be just about the sensuality. I mean, yeah. it's just just playing with it even whilst it's not on is lovely. Yeah. And and it can kind of begin and end with that, can't it? It can begin mm. with just a very yeah. gentle massage, kind of bringing that intimacy in. Whether yeah. it becomes something that is sexual touching or direct mm. intimate touching, But this is wonderful. Yeah. This is wonderful. And just imagine that if you haven't been feeling sensual for a long time, you're not sort of in touch with that part of your body. Just something like this, really soft, really gentle, even just in front of the TV. You don't have to take your clothes off. You don't have to make any particular effort. It's literally just for you to begin to sort of think about some sort of mm. sensuality or intimacy with yourself or with a partner. And something like this, you can absolutely use it with a partner as well. Um, something you can stroke each other, that can be kissing, that can be touching, but it doesn't have to go further because you're now at the point where you can reframe what sex means for you. Maybe it means more sensual play. Maybe it means just watching each other you know maybe you don't have the energy to go further but maybe you're happy to watch your partner play you know maybe they're happy to have you watch them or maybe you play with yourself they play with yourself it is just kind of about finding what you're comfortable with what you're happy to try and then also checking in with each other afterwards to say how was that for me would i like to do that again how was that for you um so just kind of using play so we tend to not use the word foreplay we use the word mm. play because foreplay indicates that something comes after which again yeah. is often penis in vagina which can be stressful yeah very stressful so just like play sensual touching um it might not go further than that you might be quite happy to fall asleep next to each other you know Brilliant. I really hope some medical professionals are listening as well as uh, people living with and beyond cancer because, mm. wow, there's just so much to learn. I mean, I learn from you every single time we speak, Renee, and I've <laughs> discovered new toys. I'm like, I think I've got all the toys. Oh, my yeah. God, I don't. <laughs> there are <laughs> more toys. 
<laughs> new toys. One more thing. This is one of my favorite toys. So massage is very intimate. Um, it's a very nice way of touching each other. So we have warming massage candles at the shop. So you light them as a normal candle. They let out this wonderful fragrance and the wax become a really nice warm massage oil. So you then dip your fingers into the oil and you can touch yourself, stroke yourself or your partner. But I also have what I like to call a uh, popping candy mousse for adults. Cheryl, for the so, purposes of everyone oh, wow. listening. Yeah, oh. look at this. I've this actually looks stretched. like shaving amazing. foam. It's not shaving <gasps> foam. Oh, wow. Yeah, it really? feels like popping candy. It's Ooh. incredible sensual to touch. Oh, and it's home. also incredibly sensual to be massaged with this. But for those of us who are in early menopause, menopause, postmenopause, we have internal heat going on. This is a cooling product. Oh, that is so sexy, Cheryl. <laughs> it's like ASMR, isn't it? it? Is. I mean, this is wonderful. <laughs> wow. So this is one of my absolute favorite products um, that we stock. And I think not enough people know of it or they don't understand what it is. But once you kind of showed someone like we've done now, Cheryl, it kind of just it stroke your skin. Deep. It's delicious. It's going as well. <laughs> And it feels, you get the one sensation when you're rubbing it in, when you're massaging it in, but then there is also the other sensation from your skin. So it's kind of like a double oh, whammy really? of pleasure. <laughs> I bet you wish you were here, Emma. I know, I wish I'd taken the train now. I'm missing out so much. <laughs> so um, again, you know, just email me, call me, pop into the chat box and I can help you find fun things to play with that sort of just lets you explore your sensuality or intimacy with your partner that doesn't have to be too taxing or too heavy, just kind of at the level that you're comfortable with. I know, and I know Cheryl will agree, a lot of what we want to do is make people feel kind of less alone. and They, they do have yeah. those options. And having a cancer diagnosis or living post-cancer diagnosis, post-treatment, wherever you're at in that cancer journey, it's kind of finding that community that will tell you that it's okay to have these conversations. Community is so important for sort of feeling less alone. And I think that's a big thing that Shine do, isn't it? And there's so many groups that people can join and start those conversations. Yeah, I mean, the the range, it always surprises me, the range of conversations. And most of our meetups are um, like social events. So we'll do things that people in our age group normally do. So we might go to the pub, we might go for a walk and a coffee and it always surprises me like the range of conversations so um and also surprises people how much fun they have I think as well just um you know you don't think you're going to go to a cancer support setting and laugh or you know have a giggle and I think one of the things like Rennie with that range of toys is just so brilliant that there's something for everyone, isn't there? And I think people listening to this, you know, if they're part of Shine Community, like post something in our Facebook groups or in our chat groups and start a conversation. Like Sarah said, it's then empowering people to know that it's okay to talk about and it's okay to think about and, you know, it's okay to have, you know, needs and wants and things that are pleasure and not just trying to keep yourself alive, which is what a lot of the focus is, especially through hospital treatments and stuff. But That's yeah, I, I need to come visit the store now as well because I'm missing out. <laughs> <laughs> I was writing a shopping list as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, Emma. And the thing is, sadly, the stats are saying one in two of us will be living with cancer mm -hmm. in the future. We, all, we already are, but it's going to get worse. So we need to be able to have a quality of life that includes sex and intimacy. And we know it's not appropriate for everyone. And we absolutely, with respect, appreciate that. But if it is for you and you want to reclaim your pleasure, I definitely suggest visiting oh. Shush Women's Store. I definitely suggest reading the Pleasure and Intimacy book. And I definitely suggest you connect with Shine Cancer Support. That's wonderful. Oh, my God, this feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Renee and Emma, for joining us today. What a great conversation it's been. And, you know, I hope for those listening at home, you've been inspired or at least just given that permission to think about this, to have those conversations. 
But I would like to bring us to the final question, which is the passing the dildo round. So Rene has supplied a wonderful dildo for me to pass. So I will start with Rene. What is your favourite way to create intimacy that is not in a sexual way? Mm, thank you, Sarah. Um, so this is a beautiful gold dildo with a shimmer in it. So if you're going to have a dildo, I think it should be gold <laughs> and shimmer. My favourite way to create intimacy that's not sexual is instead rather sensual. So me and my partner, we are great hand holders. So for me, intimacy is with my partner um, at home. Um, it's very cosy. I have fairy lights. I have candles. Just sitting on the sofa, holding hands. I think holding hands is probably one of the nicest things you can do with someone. And you might have a small conversation or you don't even have to have any kind of conversation at all. So just a night in, holding hands with candles and maybe a glass of wine for me. Cheryl. Thank dildo. you. I'll take this dildo with pleasure. <laughs> it's very beautiful, by the way. Um, for me, being intimate with myself can start with doing my feet. So a pedicure of my feet. I love soaking my feet in warm water, scented water, scrubbing it gently, making sure that it's nice and smooth and then painting my nails and painfully watching them dry and make sure they don't dry because I don't like smudge nail varnish. I get great pleasure from that. And then obviously, if someone's privy to be able to see those feet, even better. But that's my way of being intimate with myself. That's wonderful. Sarah, I'm passing you the dildo. So I think for me, one of the nicest ways to create intimacy that's in a non-sexual way is quite often just sleeping naked. So that's something I can do for myself. Perhaps it's more for the summer months, I would say. Uh, so as we come into winter, I might have to find something else. But it just reconnects me with my body. It kind of grounds me in the space. I can just feel my skin in contact with the bedding. Maybe I'll put on some nice fresh bedding and just be present with myself and enjoy. So, Emma, I'm going to metaphorically pass you the dildo onto the, the Zoom screen. Thank you. I love the grabbing action. Yeah. Oh, I think so. For me, I'm a massive hugger and I love cuddles, you know, even if you're clothed and just thinking about the winter cozy pajama kind of fluffy dressing gown things. I love all of that, like textural stuff. So I think for me, unexpected cuddles, like when you're doing the washing up or when you're doing like my partner's pretty good at that, like, you know, <laughs> just uh, randomly turning up for a hug and then just snuggling up on the sofa. But I think if I was home alone, I would definitely do a Sarah then, I think, clean sheets, nothing else on or maybe the just the fluffy soft things as well so yeah maybe I'll be greedy and have two options one for when he's home and one for when he's home <laughs> why not amazing thank you Well, what a conversation that was. I mean, I've certainly learned things. I learn things every single time Renee brings in the wonderful batch of toys, that is for sure. Oh, Renee is amazing. I mean, her expertise behind toys and how to use them safely and how to acquaint your body with trying something new is just fantastic. I mean, I'm surprised I didn't have an orgasm the way... <laughs> The discussions we were having, but you know, that's what it's all about. I mean, even if you don't have an orgasm, she quite rightly said to us, it's about reconnecting with the body. Yeah. And like bringing out space for any kind of pleasure, like pleasure is a wonderful spectrum of experiences. Mm. And yes, orgasms are wonderful, um, but there's just so many different ways to experience pleasure and just allowing yourself to explore that. Um, those tentative steps. But I think also, you know, what Emma was saying about community and sharing and, and yeah. just wonderful that Shine hosts events in pubs. I mean, that, it's where the best conversations happen, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. And for the appropriate age groups as well. Yeah. So, you know, that's where they connect and this is where they form their peers, peer support groups and so forth. So what a better place to um, have a discussion about sex and intimacy, you know, a pub. Yeah, completely. 
And next week, we are going to be looking, have t- kind of taking a closer dive into the menopause, aren't we? And body altering surgeries. Uh, we'll be joined by Lucy and Liz, and we'll talk a little bit more about their experiences of cancer and what they have done to reclaim elements of their journey. And I think that'll be really interesting because it's, I mean, menopause is a hot topic at the Mm. moment, but especially when it's linked to someone living with and beyond cancer, especially if the um, menopause is medically induced. So it'll be really interesting to see where this conversation goes. Yeah, there's many unique elements to to the the menopause and cancer experience, aren't there? So we're going to dive into that. And we really hope you can join us next week. And thank you for listening today. You've been listening to Untold Pleasure, the Cancer, Sex and Intimacy podcast. Please like, rate and review this podcast because that is the best way that we can get this far and wide to the cancer community. Please also follow us on Instagram at sex underscore cancer underscore intimacy or drop us an email on cancer and intimacy at gmail.com. And keep passing that dildo. (laughs) 